So, hello, everybody. Oh, God, that's too long. Is it? Yes. Very confronting. Um, so, very happy to be here. Um, I work for an organization which is called Sense About Science, and we stand up for evidence in the public. Uh, we defend the use of science, scientific facts in public debates. We don't shy away from the difficult issues, so we tackle topics like homeopathy and vaccination, GMOs. Um, but we look at things from a citizen's perspective. We don't um, defend the scientists, we really look at what the, uh, the societal benefit is of using evidence. And we, um, we're going to defend the interests of the citizens, not of the researchers. So we started about 15 years ago in the UK when there were a lot of scare stories in the media about mobile phones, frying your brain, uh, GMOs at the time, uh, a lot of the anti-vax movement starting then. And a lot of people were asking, where are the scientists? Where are the researchers? We're not, we're not hearing them, they're not speaking up. And in fact, the scientists were a bit afraid to engage in these debates because it gets so aggressive from time to time. So Sense About Science was set up to work with the experts and the scientists to uh, stimulate them to interact with the public debates and to help them to do it in a better way. Um, I, at the time, was working uh, in Brussels for science academies, giving scientific advice to the EU institutions. So I was an evidence provider. And it became very clear uh, quite quickly that in difficult polarized topics like GMOs and pesticides, you can say whatever you want as a scientist to the politicians, and actually they hear what you say, and they understand it. But they will have to say at some point, um, I know, but the public opinion here is so strong, and this is still a democracy, a representative democracy, and we can't ignore the public opinion. So it became clear to me that we needed to work on a public debate as well. We needed to communicate as researchers with the public as well as directly with the politicians. So when I discovered Sense About Science, I thought, this is it. Um, and they luckily also thought that there was more need for this type of interaction um, in Brussels, but also in the wider EU. And so we found each other, that was great, and we set up Sense About Science EU a bit over a year ago now. So we do, oh, oh, what I'm going to do is just give a small overview of some of our campaigns, because we're very flexible. We just look at what's needed and then we come up with a creative idea to tackle that problem. I'll, I'm going to give a couple of examples which I think are most relevant for you. And at the end of my presentation, I'm going to summarize some of my own personal learnings about debating um, with people who have different opinions, um, who have non-evidence-based opinions and how you can improve these debates. So here's the first example of what we do, where we see there's a clear gap in the debate. Um, we might work on a specific topic, and we have these making sense of guides. We make them um, with experts, uh, but we include citizens and we include the public to make sure that what is in these guides is actually relevant for the public. It's the kind of questions that they ask them. And we will not only say what the evidence is saying, we will also give some guidance to the people on how to know when they see new claims, whether this makes sense or whether it's pure nonsense. So we don't limit to the facts. We also give some tools and some guidance for making your own evaluation, even as an non-expert. This is our biggest public campaign, and we it's a campaign to challenge public claims. And we started that campaign when we, we kept receiving questions from people who say, I don't know what to believe sometimes. How do I know whether a claim is true? How do I know who to trust? And it usually comes down to asking for evidence. And we thought, actually, we don't have to do that. Anyone can ask for evidence. So we started a public campaign. We help people to ask for evidence and then to understand it as well. 
So we have a very user-friendly website where we help them to formulate the claim and uh, we help them drafting an email uh, to whoever has made the claim and we follow up with the responses that they get. When they get back evidence, we also have some tools to help them understand the evidence. So we explain things like peer review, uh, clinical trials, systematic review, all at a level that is usable for people who don't have any scientific training. And then we write these stories up in you know, um, little blocks, which we, we've seen gives a lot of inspiration and motivation to others to do it as well. Um, there are some brilliant examples here of people who actually created change in big companies or in government policies just by asking for evidence. So it's a great tool of power and these inspiring stories motivate other people to do the same. If you want evidence to be available for the wider public, you need an open research community. You need the scientists and researchers to talk about their conclusions and to be available for the people to ask questions. Um, so we are working mainly with early career researchers because mainly in the UK we've seen that they have specific problems um, with engaging with the public, standing up for science and we're saying to them you don't have to wait until you have a professorship to stand up for science, you can do it already now. So we give them workshops where they get some skills and where they get motivated again, they get good examples, uh, best practice examples of how to stand up for science. And they, they've set up a reputation for myth-busting and evidence-hunting campaigns and I'm just um, alerting a couple here. So this is one of my favorites, which is a detox dossier um, they just look for evidence behind detox products and you won't be surprised to hear that there is none. So they, um, they wrote that up in a dossier and they literally walked the streets with it. They just you know, went to, to stand at the entrance of stores which sell detox products and handed out this dossier to everybody who entered the store. They also had a big media campaign and they got a lot of publicity. And you see that they even made a magazine like Marie Claire where you would normally expect um, a promotion of detox products. And in this case, Marie Claire said, be careful with detox products. Because here's this group of young scientists who say that actually it's not working, might even have some risks. Another great campaign was against homeopathy. So again here, they addressed the public directly, but they also went to a higher level. Um, they uh, wrote letters to all the directors of the major disease programs of the World Health Organization. And it took a lot of chasing and phoning and, and asking again, but eventually they had a, an official declaration from each director that homeopathy is not a cure for that disease. And they've bundled all that letters. And that was actually the first public um, opinion of the World Health Organization on homeopathy. They bundled these letters and they've sent them to every health minister um, in the world, from every country in the world. And again, they had a lot of media publicity. And this is already uh, quite an old campaign. Um, I think it was, 2012 or something, but when Ebola came up a couple of years ago, spontaneously the Guardian, for instance, referred again to um, this report of the voice network saying that homeopathy is not a cure for Ebola. So there is a long-lasting effect, which is nice. So right now, it's still mainly because you, um, for, uh, Centre of Arts Science started in the UK, our network of researchers and also our outreach to public is still has been limited mainly to the UK up to now, but we've started now to actively um, spread it out across Europe. So both Voice and the Ask for Evidence campaigns where we're working with partners across Europe uh, to extend that. So, 
these are some of the campaigns we've been doing for years and we thought we were doing a very good job. And then um, in 2016, we were confronted with this. The beginning of the post-truth era, you could say. Uh, so the immersion of alternative facts and voters who don't seem to care about facts being alternative or whatever you want to call them. And so this whole debate on post-truth started emerging. And people were saying that, or some were saying that people don't care about experts and they don't care about evidence. And we thought that's actually quite dangerous because if the politicians start believing that, um, they will start stop using evidence and they don't won't feel pressure anymore to use evidence and they will only care about sound bites and emotions and that's actually what we're trying to fight here. Moreover, even though this is the title of my presentation, at Sense About Science, we don't believe in a post truth society. We just see too many people who care about evidence, and not just the researchers and the scientists, but also people from all walks of life. And they were concerned also about these debates and about how politicians would respond to it. So we said, you know what, you have to tell the politicians yourself that you care about evidence. And so we brought a bunch of them to the European Parliament to talk to their members of the European Parliament, their representatives there. These are not researchers. You might recognize one or two of them, because some of them are very active in the skeptics community. But um, I've got here, for instance, a Dutch farmer and a Romanian teacher um, and an Irish mom. And so these are people really from all walks of life. They don't usually have any link with research or science. But they all came with a bunch of others with them to the European Parliament to say, I care about evidence, and I want you, my representatives in the parliament, to use evidence. So these were the messages that they were bringing. So we want the commission to use evidence. We want commissioners to explain their reasoning as well. We want to know which bits of a decision are evidence and which bits are you know, value judgment or political judgments. That's fine, by the way, you can have those. And we expect the parliament to be evidence hunters on behalf of their um, constituents, on behalf of their voters. We want them to be looking for the evidence. Because EU affairs is complex, you know, you can't expect every citizen to be able to analyse a new decision or a new proposal. Uh, now I'm sure that all of you will agree with these demands. So this campaign is still running. Um, we want to make sure that every member of the European Parliament has received multiple emails from their voters saying we want you to use evidence. So if you want to get involved, go to the website, there's some um, explanation there of where you can find your uh, representative and what you can ask them, how you can ask them to get involved in this and to commit to using good evidence. So, that's what we're doing with politicians, but there is something to do with the um, larger public as well. And I really like what Diego said about uh, memeing places, because that's a bit of the problem here. Sometimes um, people refer to echo chambers as well. There's a lot of people out there who, they, who care about evidence um, and they want to take good decisions. But they actually never hear other opinions than what everybody else in their community is saying. So it's very important to stay vocal about evidence and to make sure that people hear other viewpoints and hear other perspectives. And that's why people like you are so important, because you're embedded in all corners of society. You all have different backgrounds, you all have different hobbies, and you just have to keep talking about things like this. The challenge is, or is that you'll get a defensive reaction and you're actually making the polarization worse rather than improving the debates. Um, so I've set up a couple of guidelines um, in my experience what helps to have an actual conversation and to move forward um, in a discussion rather than have a, a fight where you're just opposing each other. 
No, the motto we use for that is public-led expert feds. Um, so it's the public that asks the questions. It's the experts that give the answers. Because very often, science communication looks a bit like this. You've got scientists giving data, giving information about topics that the public just doesn't care about. They're responding to the wrong questions. In the, in the Remain campaign, for instance, for the Brexit referendum, it was all about economy. But your average British citizen doesn't care about economy. He cares about his job, right? But what's the link with the economy? That's just way too complex. And actually, they care much more about migration. And I didn't hear many experts talking about migration, even though there's a great deal of expertise on migration as well. GMOs as well, most of the experts keep talking about the safety uh, for environment, safety for health, um, because that's what the NGOs are using as arguments. But if you really talk to somebody who's anti-GMOs, uh, they don't really care about that. What they are concerned about is corporate abuse or just too much technology in our lives. The same with vaccination. Most of the anti-vaxxers I know, and I know a couple, they, they are mainly concerned about big pharma. They're not really concerned about autism or the risks of vaccination. They just think that pharma is abusing them. And so you have to acknowledge these concerns, but you have to know what they are. Um, one of the projects that we have is because there was a, you know, this, it's such a strong debate on biotechnology and agriculture. So we have a panel of scientists, plant scientists, who respond to any question of the public. And they have to respond to any question. And so we, we get very practical questions, but sometimes quite critical and even quite sophisticated critical questions. And our scientists just have to respond in a very honest way and purely evidence-based. This is what the science is saying. And it's really, really interesting because these scientists find it fascinating as well. And sometimes, sometimes the citizens convince the scientists. Not that the scientists are wrong, but that perhaps there's a part of um, the issue that the scientists haven't been thinking of and haven't been looking into. That has happened that some of our members of the plant science group said, oh, I might want to change the focus of my research a little bit. I'll get back to that actually in a, one of the next steps. Um, so when you listen first, people are more inclined to, uh, to listen back. And you will be addressing the actual concerns. A second one is, respect. Um, if you want people to listen to you, you're going to have to respect them. If you say you're stupid, that's the end of the discussion, right? And actually most of these people are not stupid. Some of the best conspiracy theorists are really, really intelligent people. And there's research has shown that there's a direct link between your education level and your ability to deny the facts. So it's not a question of um, people being stupid, and you have to acknowledge that. You have to respect the fact that um, they have thought about this. Link to that. Um, maybe you are not entirely right either. Maybe there's something you haven't seen. Because everything is a matter of perspective. We're all human beings, um, you know, we've all been part of a, I'm going to have to, we are part of a meaning place. Um, so we have a limited perspective, so you have to be aware that the other one might have a point from their perspective. And I always engage in a discussion with the basic assumption that I'm wrong. There's something I'm not seeing. That person has a different opinion from me. That person must have a reason for it. And I start from the assumption that that person has a good reason. And I need to find out what it is. And perhaps I'm wrong, and perhaps I'll learn something. Very often, I conclude that they cannot convince me, which, which is fine, but because of my attitude, they are more open to my arguments as well. It's something that psychologists call um, epistemic charity. 
So being generous towards the other person's perspective. And it really helps in having an honest and open debate. Yeah, sure. Almost, huh? Hopefully. Have some room for questions as well. Link to that again. In any case, your knowledge is limited. Uh, a lot of problems that we're dealing with are so complex. Um, here's just an example of obesity, but you could say the same about climate change, agriculture. There's a lot of different things that feed into it and that contribute to the problem. And you can never be an expert in all of them. But you can be an expert in one of these issues, and people will listen to you um, more openly, more willingly, if you acknowledge that it's just one of the issues. You can say, look, I can tell you about that, but I know there's another issue here, and I can't really comment on that. And actually, contrary to what you instinctively would think, people will listen more closely to what you have to say then, because of that honesty. And that is a very good moment to start talking about trade-offs as well. Because the problems usually are not that simple. There usually is not one solution that benefits all. And you know, the problems that we're dealing with in agriculture, for instance, we have real dangers for our food production here. Um, but to fight the, these dangers, we will have environmental impact. So there's a very strong uh, trade-off between environment and uh, food security. Energy is the same thing. Whatever decision you take, somebody will lose. It will either be more expensive, or you'll have more environmental impact, or you know some uh, uh, you will uh, be damaging the security of energy uh, production. So whatever decision you take, it will never be perfect, and you you need a political debate as well as a good understanding of the impact of each decision. That's your evidence bit. But then you will need a political debate on which values matter most to you, which groups of people matter most to you, which interests are you going to defend most. So basically these are my five top tips to have debates like that. Um, I hope you found them useful. Um, if you want to get involved in what we do at Sense About Science, there are loads of ways to do that. So definitely, if you come across any claim uh, in policy or um, from companies who want to sell you their products and say they will be miraculous, ask for evidence. Um, you will see the impact that it has. Definitely write to your MEPs. And um, if anybody here has a bit of talent for languages and is happy to do some translations for, from English to any uh, other language for us, I'm, we're currently translating some of our resources to other languages and it's mainly done by volunteers. So I'm still looking for Polish and Spanish and a couple of others. <laughs> so come talk to me if you're happy to spend some time on that. Um, I think um, uh, I still have a couple of minutes left if anybody has questions. Um, do we are a bit over time, so okay, uh, sure. not, not you personally, but um, uh, we are a bit behind schedule. So if you don't mind, we will, we will wait with that uh, until we have the discussion time. But uh, will you be here for the, for the rest of the weekend uh, so that people can catch you? Catch yeah, yeah, I'm here um, today and um, tomorrow morning, I think. Tomorrow morning, okay. So make sure that you find her and talk to her about what Science about science does. It's brilliant what they're doing. So please give her a round of applause. <laughs>